Uh, the title of this is Departmentalizing Your Difference. That's a peculiar title, I think, because uh, a lot of people don't even have a clue what that even looks like because people don't departmentalize their difference. What they do is separate, separate, cut, divide, even tear when they run into something that's a little bit different than they believe or understand or even live. And so I've given you some uh, definitions. Now you have to listen because I don't have these written down for you. Um, the word department is a division of a larger area into a functional or assigned area which requires special expertise or responsibility. We have a children's department. We have by faith a youth department. We have adults that have a department that they go to. And to departmentalize, now listen carefully, this will change your life if you will allow it. How many of you are little, little uh, the word is disconcerted, uh, uneasy about the turmoil you see in the world today? Just a little bit uneasy because you don't know what's going to happen, right? And in that, you begin to develop opinions about what you think you know. And the truth is, you don't know anything other than what somebody's willing to share with you. Okay? You only know what you hear unless the Spirit of God is directing the course of your life. All right? And that's what this is about. So to departmentalize is to divide an organization, uh, organization or its work into departments. This is very proficient in getting a lot of work done. This is the only way to take care of a lot of jobs at the same time, is to make certain that the right people are doing the right job. And when we don't understand the difference between departmentalization and compartmentalization, we run into conflict, we run into tears, we run into discord, because many of us want to compartmentalize it and to heck with it. Because that's to separate and to divide and to lock into a box. How many of you want somebody to put you in a box? None of us. Well, how many of us want to put somebody else in a box and be done with them? Many of us. And the reason is, is we don't understand, and here you've heard me say this for years now, that it's only through diversity that you'll ever have unity in the body of Christ. You will never have unity in your marriage unless you behave differently. If your husband and wife are same thinkers, you don't have, you don't have unity. You have sameness. Will it work for some people? Compartmentalize means to separate a section of a structure or a container and which it contains certain items and keep it separate from others. One of the biggest problems in the church today is to get the youth that are separated for class back in the service. There's something about a youth group that they don't understand just because they get out of the youth group church isn't over. But there's a lack of understanding, and we have a youth department, but that doesn't mean that department is not part of the overall functionality of the church. So there's a reason that message is not being conveyed. And I honestly believe it's because the adults don't get it themselves. Amen. That's the time you go, yeah, good word. I like to hear that. So compartmentalization is to separate into isolated compartments or categories. And do you know what that creates? Polarization. You have people that think like you, think like you, act like you, do like you, instead of being the one that's swimming upstream and saying, no, I'm going to do it God's way. Nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to participate in what I'm hearing the Spirit of the Lord tell me. Nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. Amen? And as God was, really this is, this is something that I've been praying about for months, is that polarization is a division into two sharply contrasting groups or sets of opinions or beliefs. 
This creates an atmosphere where personal growth is very, very difficult. When we begin to polarize ourselves in our personal lives, between husband and wife, between children and family, etc., inside the church we have one group that says they're this way and the other group's this way and when you begin to develop polarization you begin to create division and don't even mean to but yet the diversity is not in our sameness okay it's because i'm different that i can be with you <laughs> yeah my difference makes me compatible to you because I have what you don't have, and you have what I need, and it will rub my fur backwards. It can, yes, it certainly can. And the reason that we don't see that, particularly inside the local church, is because people want everybody to agree with them even when they're wrong. Even when they're living wrong. And by that I mean even when they're not producing Productivity that brings peace to their household. How do you know when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing? You're at peace. You're at peace with it. Even if it's hard, you can be at peace with it. Amen? Do you understand that? So we, I believe, are a group of people that really want to departmentalize our differences. I don't want somebody to say, well, I don't agree with you, and so I need to go find somebody I agree with, and I'm changing churches. Good luck with that. Because you're not going to be anywhere that you're going to agree with all of them all of the time. Now, you may need to find another tribe to run with. That's a totally different deal. Right? Sure, you know what that means because we've all done it. Uh, we've been where we needed to leave. And it was for their good as well as our good. And it was peaceful in doing that. So we live in a time where I believe that our personal opinions and points of views do not give us equality. I'm a big person on equality. Equality does not mean sameness. Okay? Doesn't mean that. I have an equal right to achieve life to its fullest based on who I am. That's equality. So do you. Equality is not you and I being alike or me wanting the same thing. And polarization in our country today has created a lack of unity. And honestly, you can't live equal when somebody's always pulling against your belief system. First thing you do if you're not secure in what you believe is get mad. And anger is a catalyst for all kinds of discord. You do not have to agree with me to be around me. <laughs> I don't care if you disagree with me. Just don't be mean. Right? Don't be mean to me. What? Yeah, be kind. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> and so what, what I heard the Spirit of the Lord say is that in this, in this polarization, in this my side, your side kind of environment that we live in, you know, this is my side, this is your side, pick a side, and I'm against you. I'm going to show you how much I hate you by how I talk. I'm going to show you how disgruntled I can be when I'm in your presence. I want you to know I don't agree with you instead of just saying I don't agree with you. And if I need to separate myself from you, I will. Not for you as much as for me. It's good mental health to be away from people that bug you. Right? This is a real message. This is, this is, not, this is not a gooey end of year message. This is like you need to get your stuff together so that we can live 2019 to its fullest. Amen? Amen. And so... The Spirit of the Lord began to speak to me, and, and I heard him say, Do you know why children are killing children? Do you know why children are speaking harmful things to other children? Do you know why that there's visible hatred being demonstrated 
all through the lives that we live, not only through what we see in our environment, but what we see on TV, the horrific things that are occurring on planet Earth right now all over the world. Because people don't understand that you and I have to departmentalize our difference. We have to separate those things that will cause us to war against each other so that we can bring about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think for a moment that God himself eradicated this with the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? No, he gave us opportunity to eradicate it. It's done through you and it's done through me to put a stop to what we see today. So children do speak harmful things over one another now when given an opportunity. And then they behave violently toward one another when given an opportunity. And death by suicide is an increase. It's going up and up and up every year from the youngest to the oldest. We see people leaving prematurely because they don't know how to cope with the environment that they live in because they haven't understand, understood that you do not have to be like everybody to be successful. Our children need to know that when somebody's running you down, get away from them. Disconnect. No time should we allow our children to be around people that speak death over them. Because what they will do is they will speak death over other children, given an opportunity. Because hurting people hurt other people. Amen? I heard statistics on the, the toll of overdose last year was astronomical astronomical that not only kids are dying by drug overdoses but whole communities are losing people through drug overdose where do you think the change is going to come from drug rehab no the change is going to come from people that are changed the change is going to come from those of us that have overcome and can live that in front of over other people that are struggling to overcome. Amen? There's a disconnect between believers and the world in a way that hasn't proven healthy, evidenced by the statistics. So why do our kids do this? Because they're just mean little suckers? No, because most of the kids that do it have seen the adults do it. Bullying takes place at the dinner table. Bullying takes place with mom and dad. Bullying takes place when people don't know that they're listening to your conversation, when you are literally having somebody else for lunch or dinner because you don't agree with them. Our children hear us talk. And our children watch us live. And so we have a society of little people acting like big people, thinking nothing about killing their classmates. There's a disconnect. And if we don't departmentalize our difference, if we don't grab a hold of us being who we are and bringing peace to the situation that God has placed us in, we will not see an end as far as we're concerned in our environment. Does that make sense? The scripture that the Lord spoke to me was, and you don't need to turn there, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 is one of the keys that is needed today for personal and spiritual growth in every area of our lives. And the Apostle Paul said, quote, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The church needs to grow up and put away childish things insignificant, transient beliefs to the true reason we're here. 
and that's to bring about change in the area that God has placed us after we've been changed ourselves. Amen? After we've been changed ourselves. And our personal growth, kind of, I've, I've kind of watched my own struggles, um, those things that I still war with internally. I have come to understand that personal growth is painful because my will is, is really connecting to the will of God and it produces me to change because he's not going to change. The struggle is because I want him to change. I want him to change his opinion about the people I don't think so well of. I want him to change his opinion about the situation that I'm in. I want his opinion to change so that I can have my way. Instead, growth is painful. And sometimes it's not done overnight. Sometimes it takes years to get a handle in a particular area that you've been very wounded in. And that's okay, as long as you're working toward the goal. Putting away childish thinking, putting away childish behavior, working on understanding what Father God is saying to you. So when we come into the will of God, then we come into the will of God by surrender. We come in and say, your way, not my way. I don't understand your way. I don't get it sometimes why you do what you do, but I surrender to why you're doing it even though I don't understand. And give me the grace to stand in my place. Amen? And so, uh, I just got this kind of like this. You know how you get certain things, and if you don't write it down, you forget it. Maybe you don't forget it. I forget it. So I wrote these down really quick, and then I have gone back and I've studied it. Uh, there was a, a, a group of unlikely men and women who created a movement that changed their society and when it changed their society, it changed the world. Just a group of ordinary, everyday people. And I wrote down just a few things that we know to be true about these people. Is that some of them were fishermen. Right? Yep. Some of them were fishermen. Uh, some of them were tax collectors. Uh, some of them were arrogant experts in the law that had no love for people. He changed the world. He's, he's who we study. And he started off on the wrong side. Amen. Then we have women who were business owners. We have women who were the first to run with the Lord Jesus Christ in ministry. We have names of some of them, and many of them we don't have names. But we have women that lived in certain areas in their lives that other people wouldn't have anything to do with them. But what they had that we have to have is a heart to serve. And these people had a heart to find out what God was really like. Amen? How many of you today have a heart to find out what God's really like? What do you really like, God? I know what my grandmother said. I didn't like it. I know what other people have told me. I found that not to be true. So you tell me what you're like. And what I hear from him and what you'll hear from him will resemble you and not me. Will you hear a different truth? No, you'll hear the same truth. You love your neighbor as yourself. You love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And then you love one another as you love you. If you don't love you, you can't love me. Amen. Just the very principles of understanding the character of God. But in their service, I want you to see that they had lots of trouble. And as God spoke this to me, I understood the necessity of being able to move past uh, offense, being able to move past conflict. How many of you honestly, don't raise your hand, in your own little head, how many of you have a problem moving past somebody absolutely disagreeing with you? I'll look down. <laughs> Just don't look at me. How many of you have problems settling it? 
I heard an aunt, mine, God love her precious heart, she's with Jesus. She still was hacked off at her mother. And she was well into her 80s. And I said, oh my God, <laughs> please Lord Jesus, don't let me hate anybody for when I was a kid and I'm in my 80s. Well, I'm almost there. Thank you, Jesus, I don't hate anybody for anything about anything. But she could still cry because of what her mama did to her. That's pathetic. That's a lack of insight. That's a lack of revelation. That's stinking thinking. Because if I live in that realm, I'm going to live that realm to my children, and my children are going to perpetuate my offense because that's all they've seen. And I'm going to polarize them from the truth by me being what they know. My mama said this. My mama said this. Or my daddy or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So there were two women in the Bible that were at odds with each other. There were men in the Bible that were at odds with each other. There was one man that wanted to see the Lord Jesus Christ do exactly what he said, and his name was Judas. And he did everything within his power to open a door to make Jesus perform so that they could take over. Instead, it resulted in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Big stuff. This is deep stuff. We read it in the Gospels without understanding that they were human beings living regular lives like you and I live today, having serious conflict with one another, but still putting it in a place it needed to be so they could carry the Gospel to the world. We give ourselves permission to stop serving God because we're offended. Offense stops us dead in our tracks without understanding. Departmentalize it. You don't agree here. Put it over here and settle it. Don't be afraid of it by locking it in a box. It's not going to jump out and get you. It happened. It's in the past. It's over. You can't fix it. Amen? Amen? And so the first one was that, that I, I felt like I wanted to share with you was about Paul and Barnabas. And in the book of Acts, you see the entire story, if you ever take the time to read it, of Paul's call, his life and ministry, how he was called, what he did, where he went, and all the people that he just picked up along the way, which is really exciting because you see the people that he picked up along the way, he later splintered with many of them. And the reason, you'll see the reason that he did in this one particular story is this is found in Acts 15 in verse 36 through 39. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how everybody's doing. Kind of reminds me of Brother Winston. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. Paul insisted that they not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the work. Well, that story is found in Acts 13. You see that John Mark was young. He was young. He was inexperienced. And in that, he got in a place where he's going, huh, I ain't doing this. And he went to the house. He took off and went back to Jerusalem. Paul didn't forget it. They're getting ready to do something that is very, very important to Paul. He's the one with the word. Barnabas, come with me. No, we're not taking the kid again. I don't have time to deal with him. He will leave us again. I just need him gone. Now listen carefully. By departmentalizing that difference, by speaking up for what he said wouldn't work for him, this won't work for me. There, the Bible says, and here's the words, then the contention became so sharp, so sharp that they departed from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark, which was a cousin, I believe, and he sailed to Cyprus. And Paul went on. What happened? 
The word went one direction, the word went another direction. They departmentalized their difference by separating for the time being. It didn't last because they came back together again over and over again, you see it in the word. But they didn't find it out and say, okay, I'm quitting. I'm quitting, I'm not doing this. And when we, we look at the scripture where they were called in Acts 13, 1 through 3, it says that in verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them. Called them, called them. I didn't just call Paul, I called them. You are all called. Know what you're called to do. Don't look for somebody else to tell you what you're called to do. Know what you're called to do. And then have the gumption to get up and go do it. Amen? Many of us have calls and we just sit on them. It's inconvenient to be called. It's inconvenient to be called. Because you're constantly submitting and surrendering. You're going to understand this. It gets old to say, Lord, I really don't want to do that. And he says, but I really want you to do that. And so you surrender and you submit and you do it. And the Bible says that they laid hands on Saul and Barnabas and sent them on their way. And what is so cool about the Bible is you get just a snipping of how important John Mark was to Paul. And if you don't study your Bible, you'll never see that in Colossians 4.10, um, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. He's in prison. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. So who had Paul sent instructions to the church in Colossae? With Who did he send to Colossae with instructions? Paul sent John Mark. Do you see the connection be being able to departmentalize something and move on without bringing discord? And how that doesn't mean the end of anything. It just is an interruption to do what you need to do. Amen. 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 So important that you read the Bible. And then this one I really liked because I thought of our church. <laughs> and it just tickled me because I'm almost this bad in a good way. Okay? I'm almost bad in a good way. But in Philippians 4, 2, 3, in writing, in writing, Paul is in prison. He has the audacity to put two women's names down in his letter and he tells everybody that reads the letter they're fighting can you imagine if I stood up here today and I said Sherry and 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 Donna Lynn are at it I want you all to talk to them tell them to straighten up you, number one you probably would never talk to him about it because you'd be too embarrassed the second thing is you'd get together and talk about what was going on without finding out what was going on. But Paul, in his understanding that I'm going to point this out because their lives are going to be a lesson to you and I want you to help with this. And he said, please tell these ladies to get along. These ladies had walked with him and served with him from the very beginning. And they came into a disagreement and wanted to compartmentalize their disagreement. They didn't want to put it over here and continue on. They wanted to make it a deal. And Paul was afraid that their discord would disrupt the church. Discord disrupts the church. And you go, well, really? Well, does it disrupt your home? This is just a little piece of your home. Of course it disrupts the church. And then there was Paul and Peter. And that's found in Galatians 2, 11 through 14. We all have a little Peter in us. 
Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I, under, I withstood him face to face because he was to be blamed. He's putting this in writing. He says, I'm going to tell you what he did so you'll understand what he did so that you don't do it. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Peter's hanging with the Gentiles, acting like a Gentile, until his religious friends come. Okay? So, here we are, hanging with our worldly friends, acting like the world, Everybody can nod and act like you understand what I'm saying. And then we see our religious friends, and we quit doing what we're doing. How many of you, oh, I just love this because I did this. How many of you have had on a TV program and somebody pulled up in your yard and you're going, oh, Lord, they don't need to know I watch this, <laughs> and turn your TV off or change the channel, whatever. I did that one time, and <laughs> I was so convicted and sorry that I was such a hypocrite that I never did it again. But do you understand that as Peter, as a leader, is running with the bad boys, and his religious bunch shows up, and so he begins to act like a Jew again? Well, P uh, Paul saw him. I'm glad Paul doesn't live here. <laughs> Now listen, listen, this is what I want you to get. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. You influence the people you run with. And they influence you. Your friends influence you, and you influence them. And pretty soon you find yourself doing things you had never done had you not been with them. Adults, from the oldest to the youngest, were influenced by the people we hang with. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, here he goes again, I'm going to make you an example publicly. I don't think people would come to church. I think we're too sensitive. I think we whine a lot about getting our feelings hurt because somebody used a tone of voice that we don't appreciate. Or they were looking at me when they said that. <laughs> I look at all of you. <laughs> at least I try. <laughs> this is what he said. If you being a Jew live <laughs> in the manner of Gentiles and not as a Jew, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews? Why are you telling the world they need to live different than they live when you live the same way when nobody's watching you? Because we don't get it. There's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. We don't do it on purpose. We just do it because it's easier. I love the reality of the gospel cleaning up my life and the way I think about life. And I love it when I see people change their lives and their friends as they clean up their own system. You can't go back to what you used to call normal and grow in the things of the Lord. You can't do that. Bible calls it a dog returning to his own vomit. It's the same kind of feeling that you get when you end up living like you used to live, especially when you were younger. And all of a sudden, you're going to try it on again and see if it'll work for you this time. It won't. And the greatest example for me as a minister of the gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 23. It's all, it's, it's all over uh, the gospels because Jesus talks about it a lot. But in, in just six verses in particular, 
Jesus begins to speak to the multitudes and to his disciples. And I want you to listen, I want you to listen very carefully because we've made some personnel changes in our church, right? We are, we are regrouping. We are sticking to what we believe to be true and to live it not only inside but outside, right? You understand that? But in that, we have to understand that the gospel is, does, not, it does not change. You can't decide what part of the gospel you're going to leave out just because it suits you to do so. All right? An example just popped in my head. Uh, the lack of forgiveness. Envy, jealousy, strife. Disunity. So on and so on and so on and so forth. You can't decide that you're going to adopt that behavior and move on in the things of the Lord and accomplish what you want to accomplish. You can do it if you want. It won't work for you ever. But, but it's really smart not to. But I want you to listen to what Jesus said in verse uh, 2 of chapter 23. Uh, then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They are leaders. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. Now listen, because this is still under the old covenant, right? We all know that. This is not the new covenant. This is the old covenant. He says that you observe it and you do it. But do not do according to their works. For they say and they do not do. Pay attention to the word. Pay attention to what the Spirit of the Lord speaks to you through the word of God, which means you have to read it to know it. But do not pay attention to your leader's behavior if you see them doing differently than what they're teaching. Does that make sense? You can't follow a leader that's going down the wrong path. It's very difficult to follow a wife or a husband that's going down a road you don't want to go down. It's very difficult for children to know which side to be on when the discord begins. You can't, you can't create a behavior inside your workplace that doesn't produce peacefulness. And he said, you pay attention to the word, but you don't copy them because they don't do what they're teaching you. And what was he telling them? Departmentalize your differences. There's nothing wrong with the word they're giving you. What is wrong is their behavior. Put it where it needs to be. Don't copy behavior. Copy what the word of God says. And Paul was even bold enough to say, do what you see me do. Because he caught it. As a legal expert, he caught that his life had to be congruent with what the Lord Jesus Christ said. And he worked his whole life to get it right, didn't he? And here's kind of what he saw. Now, they're teaching the, teaching the word. Now, listen carefully. They're teaching the word. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on, the shoul on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move one finger with the other. They want you to do it, but they have no intention of doing it. Cornerstone is never going to operate that way. And I can boldly tell you, when there's an incongruent lifestyle outside this building, I will eventually get wind of it, and we will handle it. Privately. <laughs> Privately. Because that's my personal belief system. I couldn't do anything but that. And then he goes on and he says, But all their works they do, they do to be seen by men. They make their uh, phylacter phylacteries, anyway, those little thingies that hang down on the sides of their hats, broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. And they love the best places at feast and the best seats in the synagogue. Move over, I am here. We came from a time where when the 
person walked in. He didn't come in from that door. He always came in from a side door. And I say him because I never saw women do anything except sit in the front row and take care of the kids. Never did figure that out. They didn't want you in the pulpit, but they'd give you their children. You talk about a disconnect. But they would come out. They would, can you just see it? Come out. And they would sit out. And somebody would wait on them. Do you know the only place that's ever happened to me was in Africa? And we were so put back by it that they didn't have water to drink and they gave us stuff to drink. And they put us in the front row and put stuff in front of us and we're going, here, you want some? Here, you want some? <laughs> and when we could, we'd, we'd change seats and go sit somewhere else because that's not us. That's not how we think. But what you need to understand is that just because you have somebody in the pulpit doesn't mean that you model their behavior. You departmentalize their behavior. And you know all of us are a work in progress, right? You're not going to have a perfect person stand up here, not even Brother Winston. Somebody will listen to this and tell him I said that. Even you, Brother Winston. Yeah, because we're all in the process of putting away childish things, right? And in 2019, we need to catapult ourselves forward. This being stuck this year has really, really been a deal to me personally. I have really struggled with some things that have occurred that changed the direction that, that uh, God wanted us to go. And, and so now what I want to do is rally the troops. I don't care that you don't think like I do, but I do care that you do what you believe is right. That I care about. I don't like you doing things that are not right. I won't call you out by name unless I come to your house. But it's not because of me, it's because of you. And Father feels the same way. Stand to your feet. There is so much in this lesson that some of you are going to go home and say, well, praise God, she's done. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Whoop. I think we're being tested, Mel. Yeah, yeah. So how many of you want 2019 to be better than 2018? Amen. How many of you are willing to let go of the childish way of thinking? You, first, you've got to admit you're childish. You know, I know some people, they don't even admit they're wrong. Guess who doesn't want to be around them? Right. Because I'll sit here and tell you day and night, yeah, I screwed that up. You know, not because I'm proud of it, but because I know that I am maturing in my understanding of the gospel. Amen? And you should never be so arrogant that you think you have a handle on this. Because I will be glad to tell you you don't. But I will tell you you can. And I will tell you that some of you have made profound changes. I found on my calendar the first day that Gamel uh, started to work at Spirit. I went... Cool, because I keep a calendar of stuff like that. And I just said, God, you're so good to open the doors for that young man. And, of course, pray, you know, just say, thank you, Lord. But do you know that promotion creates problems that weren't there before you got promoted? You have a whole other set of issues that you didn't have before you had a steady job. You just change them. Right. Right. And so we're learning to grow and to develop and to move beyond that. Then you have challenges with your health. And you're going, that sucks. That's a spiritual word. I know it's somewhere. It's in the book of Paulette. <laughs> but you can't, you can't reason. You can't reason that. You can't reason why Lou is still having issues with her eye. You can't reason why others are having problems, especially health problems, not to mention financial problems. 
there's so much that goes on that you and I have to stay focused on the prize that's set before us. And then we make a concerted effort to reach, to reach for the truth. And in that, we're strengthened. Amen? Doesn't mean we don't fall and cut our little knees or bump our nose. And it doesn't mean that sometimes we just don't sit down and whine. Whining is good for you from time to time. Yeah. And if you have a group that'll whine with you, that's even better. I'm a private whiner. I like to be alone. You're going to love 2019. You really, really are. You're going to see God move in ways that you haven't expected. You're going to see things move out of the way that have been in the way. And you're going to be faced with challenges that you didn't know were coming. And you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. So be encouraged. This is it, folks. I won't see you again until next year. <laughs> I don't think I can wait that long. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for this particular group of men and women and young people. And Father, I thank you that you're teaching us how to grow up and to be who you've called us to be. I thank you that we truly are a peculiar people, that we're called to walk alongside of you on this earth, living out your plan and your purpose for our lives.